Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Living Astrology with Janet Hickox. Grab your cup of coffee and your tea, or your tea, or you can have both, I suppose. Sit back and relax, and let's chat about what's going on up in the stars today. I hope it's a great day for all of you. It's so close to the winter solstice, and you can tell because it's so dark in the mornings. I mean, here it is, 8 a.m. right now, my time, and it is still dark enough outside. You need light to see kind of crazy, right? But pretty soon the light will begin to return. Thus is the turning of the seasons. And we can't wait then for spring, right? Although let's, you know, let's just take our time <laughs> and enjoy the moments that are in front of us so that we don't push ahead and miss something interesting, wonderful, and uh, happy making. Today we start our day with the moon in Virgo love love it when the moon is in virgo maybe because i have my own natal moon in virgo who knows uh, but today the moon in virgo is also in a trine to uranus and jupiter so we have inspiration we have maybe the uh, energy to get some things done uh, it does square virgo or i mean the moon in virgo squares mercury so we may have some other things going on in our minds that keep us a little bit dizzy for a while. But for the most part, we're looking at what might be a really nice kind of day. Uh, let's say good morning to people who are just joining us. Marissa, good morning. Elisa, good morning. And Mimi, hello there to you. Colleen, good morning. Christine Erickson, good morning. Londa, hello. Uh, Mimi says, good morning, everyone. Very ready for solstice. And Elisa says, good morning. Uh, great to see everybody out there. So yeah, I'm ready for the solstice. Um, I, I yeah yeah. It's just I can't even believe we're already here at this point in time, right? Where did where did 2019 go? It seems like only yesterday, just yesterday it began, and now we're talking about its ending and the beginning of what comes next, 2020, a new decade. Uh, a decade that begins with a big bang, basically a big earthy shove of change and transformation. So we might as well kind of get used to that thrumming sound in our ears of, ah, oh, what comes next? What do we deal with next? Because the world is in change, right? So talking about Virgo, let's look at what some of the things are that we can expect while the moon is in that sign. First of all, Virgo is a sign, of, it's an earth sign. So elementally, it is related to Capricorn. And uh, you know what's going on there. We have a lot of planets sitting in that sign. Here, if I show it to you in a chart, you're going to see, right? There's Capricorn right there. And basically, these symbols have to get so little teeny tiny now just to fit everything in there. And then on winter solstice, then we're going to be adding uh, the sun's energy to that. Not long behind that, we're going to add Mercury's energy to Capricorn. The only thing we're missing from Capricorn by the time we get into the first of the year is Venus. And so we, well, thankfully, we have, you know, some planets that are starting, will start to spread out a little bit after that. But uh, initially, at least, and right from right now until, until at least... The middle to the late part of January, we have a lot of energy in those Earth signs. So understanding Earth is a good bet for helping to understand for yourself what is going on. So Virgo energy is uh, an Earth sign, like I said, but it is also a mutable Earth sign. So where Capricorn is the um, cardinal Earth sign, it starts new things, right? It's an initiation sign, initiating sign. Virgo is much more about change. So when the moon gets into Virgo, it's about how are we changing what we're focused on. And in uh, the, the natural astrology chart, Virgo rules the sixth house. And the sixth house is the house of work, service, and health. So as it relates to work, it focuses us in on our coworkers or the environment through which we work. So it also includes our daily routine. So we get to work and we sit at our desk or we, you know, open up uh, our computer and we, you know, the routines that we have on a daily basis. It also is taking into consideration the people that you work with, or in some cases, the ones that uh, are your employees. So if you are a manager uh, or the boss of a group of people, then your coworkers are also your employees. So we have that also with Virgo and the sixth house. Um, and it also rules your to-do list. How long is your to-do list? 
do you ever get to the end of your to-do list? All questions that you could ask for yourself right now while uh, we have this very practical energy in Virgo. Are you adding so many things to that list that you could never accomplish them all? So you end the day feeling like, oh, I didn't get anything done. But if you really looked at your to-do list and crossed things out as you did them, you'd see, wow, I really have accomplished quite a bit. The sixth house also rules the health, the health specifically of the physical body, so the physical being, and everything that we do then to support our health and our bodies. Whereas the twelfth house, the opposite side, which would be uh, Pisces, the opposite sign of Virgo, rules more the psychology, so the mental aspects of uh, health, so the 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 need for counseling perhaps to help that particular focus where in Virgo and the sixth house, it's the health of the body. And so we have um, the possibility of looking at more exercise or how we exercise or if we exercise and then creating a moderation in the way that we express things through our bodies. You know, moderation in what we eat, what we allow in our environment as far as toxins, uh, there's a, an energy in Virgo that's very discriminating in in fine fine uh, taste and uh, in being able to purify what they're putting in their bodies and what they allow in their environment. So we have moderation, but what, but it's sort of like a purification of the atmosphere that you are allowing into your world or that you are allowing yourself to be a part of. Healthy habits, right? Healthy habits as well come into this sign, alternative healing. And it's that alternative healing part of Virgo energy and the healing of the body that makes me always wonder if it isn't Chiron that is the better ruler of the sign of Virgo rather than Mercury. Uh, although Chiron doesn't necessarily fit the bill when you get into the organizational uh, and uh, co-worker routine kind of thing that that doesn't hit exactly. So it's interesting to see, you know, Mercury doesn't hit it exactly, but neither does Chiron. Maybe they're co-rulers of the sign. That's how things like uh, Aquarius ended up with a ruling planet like Uranus when its traditional ruler was Saturn because somehow there was just something not quite perfect in the fit with Saturn and Aquarius and so when Uranus was discovered, it was like, oh, wow, maybe we have co-rulership going on here. So maybe we have co-rulership going on with Virgo. We just haven't agreed to do that yet. <laughs> um, Virgo energy also rules organization, practical application of organizing principles, feng shui maybe, uh, seeing to the details, you know, putting, uh, tidying up your desk or your cupboards or your closets. And uh, streamlining, streamlining, do I really, if you guys could see from my position of my desk, I mean, do I really need, let's see, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 notebooks sitting in front of me. Do I really need that? I mean, my mind says, yes, I do, because when I want to know something else, I, I want to get it. Uh, and where else am I going to put them? But literally, it adds to the clutter on the desk, and I'm sure there is some way to be more efficient and more streamlined in the way that I uh, uh, arrange my desk and my books and my working area. So all these things come up for consideration during a transit of the moon through Virgo. And I'm basically laughing because there is just no way. There's no way my desk is going to get cleaned off today. I have too many other things on my to-do list. Maybe tomorrow. The moon will still be in Virgo tomorrow. Uh, Virgo, as I said, uh, rules discernment and discernment and discrimination, not discrimination where we're it being, you know, exclusive uh, or where we're not being inclusive, but the fine line between what we will accept into our, um, our, our energy or into our field and that which we don't want anything uh, a part of in our world. So discriminating, discriminating taste, for example. So discernment is about critical thinking. It is about being able to choose, if you will, what it is that we're going to talk about, what it is that we're going to believe, and how it is that we are going to show up in our world. Uh, Virgo is a sign that's pretty calm in a crisis as well. It doesn't mean that they don't feel the anxiety. Virgo is one of the more anxious um, uh, anxiety-ridden signs, and the place it 
falls in your chart is likely a house that can create anxiety. For example, if you had Virgo sitting on your second house, money issues could be a source of anxiety. Uh, if it was in your seventh house, it might be relationships that bring up anxiety. If it was in your sixth house, it might be the health of your body or your work er uh, area that brings up anxiety. But when it comes to having to react to the bigger things that happen in the world, Virgos suddenly become very calm in a crisis and they are able to discern exactly what needs to be done and exactly what order it needs to be done. And they're also planners. We are in Earth, right? Earth signs are the planning signs. They are planning the steps. And Capricorn executes the steps. So Virgo is really about planning. And Capricorn, the methodical execution of the steps. And uh, perhaps Taurus, the uh, Earth sign, is more about preparing the ground to be able to create those earthy pursuits. Now, watching out for a couple of things, right? We can get overly critical, hypercritical of ourselves and others. We can get very nitpicky. We can be very uh, prickly about things like, um, I always think of OCD when the moon moves through Virgo because, you know, it might be those things that we're repetitively doing that we catch ourselves. Like for instance, I have a thing about the dishwasher. So people can put dishes in my dishwasher, but if I go to that dishwasher, I'm going to rearrange it. It's just one of those little Virgo moon OCD things that I have going on in my life because I think they should be aligned in a specific way. <laughs> so, so what I've learned is not to blame other people that they didn't load the dishwasher right. I just put it in the order that I think it should be in. So here is where we can maybe have uh, a, a trigger for our anxiety, right, to overthinking something about what we're doing or about who's doing what in our world and also don't get into the blame shame and victim game because that virgo is really um, opposite of pisces and so it brings in the more negative qualities perhaps of pisces as the polar opposite sign and of course that's where we have the blame shame and victim energy the martyr energy as well across that entire axis so we want to be aware that uh, if we're falling into that trap, that we put a stop to that. Remember, that is so last century. We don't need that energy. Let's, it was not even a part of this last decade. So let's let that go and move forward without that victim sort of shame and blame energies. Okay, let's take a look and see comments or questions. Good morning, Debbie Tibbetts, Tumiel. April, nice to see you. Londa, 38 years ago, I gave birth to my son. Where did the time go? Wow. Well, tomorrow, 33 years ago, I gave birth to my daughter. So we both have Sagittarians around us. Your husband's a Sagittarian as well. Linda Dennis, good morning to you. Great to see you. And um, Marissa says, good morning. It's a better day today so far than yesterday. Um, actually, as I think back to yesterday, was yesterday a bad day? Um, I was triggered a couple of times yesterday, um, just with internal things going on and, you know, trying to browbeat myself over a couple of things. And uh, But all in all, it wasn't really a bad day. But here we go. We're in that Virgo energy. So uh, it's, and it was late in the afternoon yesterday once the moon moved into Virgo. So the tendency sometimes is for us to become overly perfectionistic when the moon is moving through this sign. So you know, perfection, taking a look at what is our ideal, right? What is the idea of perfection and, and whose idea is it? Is it yours or is it coming to you from outside of you, uh, from outside the uh, outside world that seems to see that uh, you need to have the very best and you have to do, you have to work yourself to the bone to get to uh, success, etc. And so asking yourself, whose um, perfection am I seeking? Right. And then the realization should be able to set in that everything is perfect right here in this moment. Otherwise, it would be something else. Right. It would be something else if it was meant to be something else, but it isn't. So it's perfect. It kind of blows your mind away if you start to try to think like that. It means that you're never wrong. You're never in the wrong place. It's always happening exactly in perfection to support you on your evolutionary journey. So Virgo tends to see it that way. Uh, but also sees how it could just be a little bit better. Let's just tweak it a little bit more. And that tweaking just keeps leading more and more to judgment and criticism and per, uh, that uh, perfection-seeking behavior. So we can take it to the nth degree. 
So let's not. Let's just see it as inherently perfect because it is. Nice, right? Um, April says, it's so nice to be here. It's nice to see you, uh, April. We haven't seen you in a while. Marissa says, I was scattered and unfocused at work yesterday and had to tell my son one of his current teachers died unexpectedly. A bunch of triggers. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's terrible. Um, a really beloved teacher passed away during spring break two years ago. Uh, and my grandchildren all go to the school where she taught. And my own kids had gone to the school where she was a teacher. She had become a client of mine. So it was really tragic on so many levels. You know, and teachers, children just sort of, you know, these are their role models besides you as parents. And so it's really hard when they have to face that eventuality that even their teachers can pass away. Um, and especially an unexpected death. And, you know, in my case, it was also a very unexpected death. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at the Pleiadian Earth energy of the day. Uh, I actually wrote quite a bit this morning about the Pleiadian Earth energy because uh, I thought it was kind of interesting today. It is an eight choosing day, choosing energy. And I started really thinking about this in the Mayan calendar. Choosing energy is ebb in, in the Mayan uh, language. It represented the road. And what road were you going to travel? So when you came to a fork in the road, there was a choice. What choice did you take? And then how did you uh, fare on that new road? And uh, did you beat yourself up for those choices? Or were they choices that led to opportunity, etc.? So the energy of choosing is about recognizing the power of choice, right? You have power in what you choose. And that means, for example, you're here, you can choose what you do versus what you don't do. You can choose how to react or whether you respond. And that is purely your power, right? Because no one else is making you make a choice in one direction or the other. People may suggest that you go that, that direction. People may even feel like they're pushing you in that direction. But ultimately, it's your decision what you choose. So we have a bit about responsibility here on this kind of a day. Now, taking uh, the bigger, wider view of this particular energy, it is that we are all here. Every one of us are here to serve the world in some way through sharing our gifts and our talents, whether that is through helping someone clean or organize something, or whether you're a doctor or a lawyer, whether you're a politician, your job as a human being on this planet, no matter what role you're taking in the outer world, is to share of your gifts and of your talents. And during this particular kind of a day, we're drawn to do just that, right? To the projects or the opportunities where we get to share of our gifts and our talents, what we're really good at. So if you are offered an opportunity today to share in the capacity to which you know you are really that you shine then what are you going to choose are you going to choose to do it or are you not right so that's the that's the um opportunity that is in front of us today um it is also a need for us to share from the heart right how to make decisions from love rather than from the more moon and virgo energies of judgment or uh, you know, thinking, overthinking and mind, uh, mind meld kind of, of thinking. So, or mindlessness even. So we have, we can be mindful or we can be mindlessness, but this particular kind of day asks us to choose from the heart. So uncovering or seeking out those reasons why you're not choosing from the heart is also an inherent part of the day today, the energy. What is preventing you from experiencing the harmony, the love, the joy of sharing from your gifts and your talents? Why aren't you doing it, I guess, becomes the question. Um, and we are presented then with opportunities that challenge ourselves to awaken the power of choice within us, to see that in every moment that we are making some kind of choice, right? Do I choose to drink my coffee or do I choose to drink water? 
Do I choose to take a walk and get some exercise or do I choose to sit at my desk all day? Do I choose to apply love to a situation or do I choose to withdraw my energy from the situation? All choice, right? Every moment is a choice, right? That's the thing that we're learning here with this energy of ebb. By the way, this is the earth energy, choosing energy. So the earth is in resonance with this energy today. And the earth is joined with the universal energy today of eight, which is about connection and abundance. Remember a few weeks ago, 13 days ago, probably 13 or 14 days ago, we talked about just this with the uh, eight right lying on its side, which is the, the, the symbol of the infinity. And that the infinity symbol was sort of the mirrored reflection of one another joined together at the heart. Right. So we look at uh, where we are mirror images for one another, uh, but we're connected at the heart. So it's kind of the energy where we see projection come in, right, where, you know, in relationship, we're often projecting outward and then other people often project back onto us. So we're playing with the role of the mirror for uh, each other. And in that it, we are connected in the middle. So the eight on its side, right? The connection right there in the middle, connected via the heart. So today is a great day for us to choose love, to choose joy, to choose to live our, our truth or our authentic selves, um, to see the higher road, to, um, to move through each choice consciously, right? Not letting the choice choose you. There's a song by the band Rush, and I don't remember the name of the song, but it's, it, you know, they're talking about this very thing where if you have, if you do not make a choice, uh, if you do not choose, you're still making a choice, right? So if you choose not to do something or not to make the choice, you're still making a choice. <laughs> it's kind of ironic, right? If, if, you if you're like, I'm not making a decision on this, you're still choosing. You're choosing not to make the decision. You're choosing not to move or you're choosing not to go forward or not to love, um, but you're still making the choice. And that's the energy that we're thinking of here in this kind of day. All of the myriads of choices, big and small, that you're making in any moment. Uh, am I going to put that sugar cookie in my mouth and eat it knowing that sugar isn't what I'm meant to eat? <laughs> Choosing, choosing. Uh, Amy Moore, good morning. And Allison, good morning to you. Karen Devine and Catherine Worcester, good morning, both of you. It's nice to see everybody out here this morning. So talking now about what else is going on today. It's a fairly quiet day, but there is something very powerful that is building, and I wanted to talk about that. So remember last week I introduced to you a, an astrological concept called the parallel, and there's also the contra parallel. We didn't talk about that so much, but the, the parallel is where planets are at the same, uh, so, uh, same side of the celestial equator and in the same plane. So at that day, it was the sun, Venus, and Jupiter, I believe, that were all in the same plane and all on the same side of the celestial equator. And it acts like a conjunction in our chart where all of these really good, juicy, fun, wonderful energies come together and uh, work well together, depending on the planet. That one was fun and juicy because they were really good energies. Now, today and tomorrow, we're building to another parallel, only this one includes Mercury, Venus, and Pluto. They're exact in that parallel tomorrow, but they're already moving in. They're all on that same side of the celestial equator, and they're just moving into the same plane with one another. And this represents to me uh, something that's going to take us deep, something that's going to take us into the depths for exploration. If we're conscious about it, it might take us into where our minds, our hearts are out of sync. And if we're not conscious, we may be presented with a problem or an irritation uh, or an, uh, what could be an opportunity that you just don't see as an opportunity. So tomorrow and today, sort of be prepared for this very uh, deep energy that's building up. Mercury and Venus are personal planets. Mercury represents the mind, pure and simple. What is in your head? What are the thoughts that are going round and round? What are the little rat race things? You know, where are the rats going round and round? Bringing you the same thoughts 
that psychosis sort of thinking, right? Where it's like insanity because I keep trying to, th to solve things from the same level from which it was created. And if it was created from the level of the mind, you cannot solve it from the mind. You have to go to a different level. And then Venus representing the heart, right? Is your heart wide open or is it cracked? Is it, um, I, you know, covered over with icicles? What is going on with the heart? And then Pluto's involvement here about transformation. Pluto is the great empowerer um, and the regenerative energies and the energy of truly a transformation. So if we string those words together, we get a mind heart transformation while we have these three planets lining up, coming together in a parallel, um, which is sort of uh, the definition of a conjunction or they act like a conjunction. They're definitely not in a conjunction, but that's what a parallel acts like, sort of like a conjunction. Just like if it's a contra parallel, it works sort of like an opposition, right? Where they're at opposite ends of, from one another, but in the same plane. So, all right, not the same degree of the sky either. So don't get the degree of the, of the planets uh, involved because they're not at the same degree. They're just at the same level with one another where they're sitting in the sky. From a higher perspective, we might be able to see how they're in an, a line, even though uh, they're, they're not necessarily in a line. And right now we can't see really Mercury and Venus because they're, they're traveling close enough to the sun that the sun sets and then these two set. So we really can't visually identify with this energy either. So that takes us even deeper, right? It means that it's something deep within us that is transforming, that is possibly transforming on the inner planes, which will then have an effect eventually in the outer world for you. So I thought maybe we'd look at where are those planets in terms of the gates in your human design. And I think there's some interesting things that come out here. So first, let me read to you what the shadows of those three gates are. Impatience, limitation, psychosis. I want to be there, don't you? <laughs> no, right? We want to move out of the shadow of impatience. We want to move out of limitation. And we want definitely want to move out of psychosis and Pluto sitting at the gate 61 literally for all of 2020 uh, is going to be teaching us a lot around psychosis. So we want to move up to the gift level of these three planets and express the gift level at least, which takes us to patience, to realism and to inspiration, right? And if we can, if we can even glimpse for a moment, the highest expression of the energies of these three gates, we get timelessness we get justice and we get sanctity, a word that I always swear that I'm going to somehow study and I never have really looked at it, but it seems like it, it, it reminds, it calls up a vision of sacredness, right? Sanctity, sacredness. Hmm. I don't know. We've had definitions before of the word. Uh, so the three gates that are involved are, let me see if I can circle them on this chart. I better move my coffee so I don't spill it in my keyboard. Uh, so the gate five is where Mercury is sitting. That's a gate of timing and rhythm. It is also um, uh, a gate that puts us in the right place at the right time with the right opportunity. But it's where we tune into and we re remain patient. It's like divine right timing. So that's what Mercury is doing. Now Venus is over at the gate 60, which is down on the sacral excuse me, on the root center moving toward the sacral. So the gate five is on the sacral moving up toward the identity center, while the gate 60 where Venus is, is on the root center, the center, the impulse center, right? The center for endurance and perseverance, the service oriented energy that moves up, pushes up from the root to other um, energy centers. And that's where Venus is. And then, uh, Pluto, not having moved much in the last several months at the gate 61. So if you look at the human design chart, by the way, today, it's a, it's a reflector day, right? There's no um, channels that are connected. So there's no energy centers that are turned on today. Just a bunch of hanging gates, which means likely you're going to play these themes out with other people in your lives. And that means also that anybody who has the opposite side of any of these gates is going to be completing a channel in your own personal world. And so the effects can be many 
and the opportunities are many for you to work through some of these three energies for sure. So Pluto in the head center, the center one, this is that proverbial question of why, right? Why? Why are things happening? And this is huge because this is a theme, a big theme for 19, for 19, for 2020 is the gate 61. And the gate five here where Mercury sitting, timelessness, um, impatience or patience. And then the gate 60 right here on the center of the uh, uh, root center moving upward. And that's where the planet Venus is sitting. So it is an evolutionarily impulsive sort of energy. It's the impulse to change, to break out of limitation, to move into realism and ultimately into justice. So interesting words that I think are setting a tone for us to move forward into 2020 and um, taking a deeper look at some of these energies. Let's, have we really looked? I'm not sure if we have. Let's see if we can look at 61 in a deeper way. I'll know when I read the book here, if we've actually, if I've introduced this to you through Rosie's work here, Rosie Aronson. 61, I was born asking why. Why were boys more valuable than girls? I don't know that we've actually read through this. Right, you're certainly better philosophy. Okay, so we're going to look at this. Let me see if I can pull out the card 61. I apologize for the uh, um, break here for a moment while I find the card. So I have to, if I was smart, I would put these back into numerical order. But there's 60 is realism. We might talk about that. Here's inspiration. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's do this. So 61 is the gate that uh, Pluto is sitting at. Look at her lovely face. There's wisdom there, right? This is an older woman's face. And what's in her forehead looks like a lotus flower. And 61 is the gate. In the gift, it's inspiration. And is that a lotus? It is. She's also got one on the bridge of her nose. Okay, so 61, let's read the story here. And again, this is from Rosie Aronson's book called The Wisdom Keeper's Inner Guidebook. It comes, this is the guidebook that comes with the cards. And uh, you can get a hold of these for yourself so you can use them in your own practice, your own spiritual practice. Uh, so it says, creativity is the single most important gift for drawing humanity out of its mass psychosis. The gift is inspiration, the shadow psychosis, the city is sanctity. The wisdom story says, I was born asking why. Why were boys more valuable than girls? Why was there war? Was God a loving God? I pondered these questions during a time in my country when they were forbidden. Though I learned to keep quiet, my fascination with religion continued throughout my young adulthood. Against the will of my religiously disenchanted parents and the fanatically atheist party ruling my country, I collected every bit of information I could from older relatives about Confucianism, Taoism, Taoism, and Buddhism. When the new constitution passed and normal religious activities were allowed, I immediately explored Islam and Christianity. When I moved to the West, finally free to explore anything I liked, I became consumed with the study of religions, especially those that had been forbidden to me. The more I learned, the more complex the picture became. I had to know where did these religions, myths, and archetypes originate in the first place? Why were there so many unexplained parallels between the world religions going back thousands of years? Where and from whom did the impossible sacred monuments and temples truly come from? I turned to archaeology and was catapulted down a wormhole that challenged everything I knew about reality. Ancient aliens will do that to you. My journey took me from the Bible to Egypt to Samaria to Lemuria to Atlantis and farther. I uncovered so many holes in scientific thought that I had to consider the strangest possibilities from ancient astronauts to stargates to rainbow bodies, time travel, multidimensionality, orbs, giants, and fairies. I became obsessed with supernovas, reincarnation, the paranormal, UFOs, crop circles, and near-death experiences. Every new answer birthed a new question. I've been down this rabbit hole. <laughs> 
People either thought I was crazy for believing certain things or for not embracing their beliefs. The pressure to understand the nature of reality became unbearable. When I finally stopped trying to get rid of the pressure and instead stepped right into it, my intellect shattered. Even I believed I was crazy, but soon I realized that most people on the planet were basically psychotic. None of us saw reality as it actually was. In that moment, I stopped asking why and was graced with true inspiration. The most spectacular art began to flow through me. I am no, I no longer needed, I no longer need to understand reality, only to experience it directly. My gift to you. I come to say that you cannot force or predict inspiration. The muse appears on her own terms in her own timing. She enters your life as a pressure, beckoning you into the unknown, calling you inwards and back to your origins. She is not always about fun and games. Sometimes she comes to dismantle your way of thinking and to shake up your entire grasp of reality and your ability to love. To welcome her into your life, you must practice immense patience and trust. Be willing to receive your inner secrets, truth, and the mystery that is all around you. Even when you can't feel her, know that she is working behind the scenes. Don't look for spirit outside of yourself. Be, capital B-E, spirit. Questions for contemplation. Might your certainty about a philosophy system or path be hiding a deeper fear of the unknown? Hmm. Is it hard to relax when you can't find the answer to a big why? Try spending a period of time without working hard to understand. Have you given up on discovering who you truly are and where you come from? Are you afraid of digging too deep? Pick an unusual inquiry for yourself and go digging. Have you ever experienced a breakdown, physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual, that became an, exp an inspiring breakthrough? Great questions for contemplation. I really love that. I even saw qualities in here, in, in the reading of this particular uh, uh, gate and gene key that that sort of mimic the, the Mercury, Venus, Pluto parallel that is building up for today and tomorrow. So interesting, right? Now, I think we have time. We do. I'm going to also go into the gate 60, which is one that I feel like it's hard to grasp sometimes what's going on with that gate or that gene key because 60, I mean, how do you go from limitation to realism and then to justice? Justice feels like an outlier to me in this energy. I don't know why. It just feels that way to me. So, I mean, justice, is it uh, about the law? What is it about? So I think it might be fun to discover that. First, let me check on any comments about that. Allison says, another true statement. Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. I love that one. Colleen says, listening to you, I'm so Virgo, but I have a dozen or more notebooks <laughs> planners because information needs to be highly organized. So keep them all. You might need more. Um, honey, I, I tell my husband on l at least a monthly basis, hey, could you bring me home another couple of notebooks? I mean, seriously, when I'm talking about notebooks, this is just a sample of what I have, right? These are, and I label them. I label them so I know what's in them. So later when I go to uh, find some piece of information, I can just thumb through the label. And if there's something important in there that I might want, then I have it. Or I put these little you know, notes here like this says health in human design. So obviously I learned something about health and human design. And then I put that there. But then I also have, you know, seven or eight of these kind of notebooks, right? The bigger notebooks with stuff in them. So I do, I collect information. And I told my kids, I said, you know, someday when I die uh, and you come across all of these notebooks, please don't think that I'm crazy because often I use them as my journal as well. Um, if something strikes and I need to get it out or vent it, who knows which book I pick up and write in it. So they might find random random venting throughout uh, any of the notebooks that I might have lying around. So it's kind of funny too. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Colleen. Marissa says, gate 60 completes my hanging gate three. And that is a channel of transformation, right? That whole channel three to 60, which joins the um, sacral to the root center is about transformation. 
and uh, change. And mutation is the other word I could come up with because often the three and the 60 are genetic mutations that are taking place outside of the realm of your own power, right? This is something that genetically is, is cued into your human design. Kathy Miller, good morning. Angela, good morning. Uh, Angela, aren't you the one that's pregnant and going to have a baby soon? And are you still pregnant or have you had that little critter? Let us know. I might have the wrong person too, but I'm not sure that I do. So Angela, let us know, okay? Um, now, I'm going to go ahead and read the card for 60. Here is the card. This is what it looks like. A completely different look in this person, right? It's it's realism. There's something wise there and open. So let's take a look and see. 60. And this card says, the only thing needed for magic to occur is some form of a structure and an open mind. Hmm. So the gift is realism, the shadow is limitation, and justice is that city. And I grew up in a part of the world where religious fanaticism, poverty, and injustice were the norm. In response to oppression, people prayed for miracles. As a child, I also prayed for a better world where women and children were given more rights. But as I got older, I grew tired of praying. Magical thinking wasn't doing anyone any good, and I didn't trust my country's laws or its lawmakers. When the dictatorship was overthrown, it became possible for girls like me to go to university. Immediately, I knew I would become a lawyer so I could change our country's sick system from the inside. The only girl in my entire family to ever receive a higher education, I buried myself in studies, learned every law imaginable, and became a skilled debater, backing up every argument against the current oppressive system with irrefutable evidence. My work life was successful, but inside I was lost, unstructured, and my relational life was non-existent. I had no true allies. My mind had become closed, limited, and rigid. I had forgotten how to dream and had lost touch with the love of justice that drove me to learn and serve. I even started resenting the very women whose rights I'd been fighting for. If they didn't agree with me or appreciate all that I was doing, I'd fly into a rage. I found them completely oblivious to what it actually took to make their dreams of a better life a reality. But they were angry with me because I was so busy protecting their rights that I had stopped loving, respecting, and regarding them as human beings with their own voices. When one of my most loyal supporters returned to her fanatical roots, I woke up, stopped arguing, and started listening to the actual dreams, needs, and desires of the people I represented. Now I see beyond the surface of things and honor the oppressed part of everyone. I use my understanding of the law to support and empower. My open mind and dreaming heart inspire all that I do. I've learned that true justice takes a village and that changing the world for the better can actually be an enjoyable, relationally nourishing process. My gift to you. I bring to you a love of realism and common sense. I want you to stay connected to your ideals and visions without losing sight of the practical aspects of the creative process. Just as a seed needs a shell and a river needs its banks, your dreams need you to understand the inherent structures of the world so that you can bring them to life. Do not see these structures as, stif as stifling or forever lasting limitations, but as supportive vessels perfectly designed to take you where you need to go and no further. Remember to keep the heart of your dreams close while holding all systems, religions, and mindsets lightly. Get comfortable with uncertainty. Think outside the box and use playful language. Seeming plateaus don't mean nothing is happening. Everything of true value lives within you. So be the eyes, ears, and mind of our universe, and soon you will be making magic. Questions for contemplation. Do you tend to run away from structure and commitment? Have you had trouble finding true allies? Are you rarely involved in something that lasts? Do you hold on tightly to your own way of thinking and doing? Without certain structures in your life, would you fall apart? That's a great question. That's a Saturn question. If you tend to be too limited, pick a structure you hold rigidly and find a concrete way to hold it just a tad more lightly this week. If you tend to be unstructured, pick an area where you struggle with discipline and experiment with following through. 
reflect on your most positive experiences of realism and justice. Hmm. I don't really think it answers my question about justice all that well, but it's still interesting, right? Interesting. So that is the gate 60 or the gene key 60, realism. Realism. All right. How's Angela says, you are correct. That's me still pregnant and surprised to be, but trusting in the timing. <laughs> Good for you, girl. So excited to see what Astro this little one will choose. Um, yeah, is it going to be Sagittarius or Capricorn? And no matter, even if it is a Sagittarius, it will have a full uh, uh, academy of planets in Capricorn. So uh, it seems to me you're bringing in a builder, a doer, uh, a structure builder, uh, whatever, male or female, uh, probably going to have a lot of interesting power, as, as all little ones coming into the planet have. Okay, well, that is it for me this morning. Tomorrow we will be talking about, what is tomorrow, the 18th? I think tomorrow we have quite a few transits going on with the moon and with other planets, so we'll be talking about that. Um, in the meantime, if you guys have any questions, you know how to find me and uh, let me know, you know how you're feeling about these two gates, 60 and 61, and even five, uh, timelessness, patience, and impatience. In the meantime, take care. Have a great day. See you tomorrow. Bye.